Hello students, in this video, we'll discuss the nth roots of unity. The nth roots of unity are the solutions to the polynomial equation z to the n is equal to 1. Now we know that z to the n equals 1 is a polynomial equation of degree n. So this is a polynomial equation of degree n. And we know by the fundamental theorem of algebra there are exactly n solutions of this up to multiplicity. Okay. Let's start by doing a simple example, a couple simple examples, and then we'll find the general solution, right? So here's the first simple example. So when n is equal to 2, you just get z squared is equal to 1. Well, that's easy. We know the solutions of this are just z equals plus or minus 1, okay? When n is equal to 3, however, we get something more interesting. We get z cubed is equal to 1, right? And now, of course, what we could do is we could actually factor this, right? One approach to this would be the following. I could write this as z cubed minus 1 equals 0, which is a z minus 1. This will sort of get the heart of the matter. And then z squared plus z plus 1 is equal to 0. And then I can use the quadratic formula on this over here, right? So let's do that and see what we get. So we'll get over here. We're always going to get z equals 1. Notice that when we plug in z equals 1, it's always going to work. So it's always going to be a solution, right? And that sort of hints at this cyclotomic polynomial structure that the remaining roots have to satisfy. Okay, great. And so, of course, if we solve this over here, what would we get? The solution of this is z is equal to negative 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 1 minus 4ac. So that's a negative 3 all over 2. So the other two roots of union are going to be 1, negative 1 plus or minus i root 3 over 2, okay? Now, of course, when we do higher dimensional things like 4, 5, or 6, that polynomial is going to become much larger. It won't be a quadratic any longer, so we're going to need other approaches to solve this, and that's where complex numbers come in and save the day. Okay, great. So let's now talk about the complex approach to solving these things. So here's the idea. So the idea is we're going to write z as r e to the i theta, the polar form of a complex number. And therefore, this tells me that z to the power n is r to the power n e to the i n theta, right? And so if z to the n is equal to 1, that says that r to the n e to the i n theta is equal to 1. Great. And now what does that tell me? That tells me over here two things, that r to the n has to be equal to 1. And n times theta, n times theta, has to be a multiple of 2 pi. Okay, or we can say that n theta is equivalent to zero, so n theta mod 2 pi. Okay, excellent. And so what can we say over here? So that tells me, and of course, what's the methodology of this? So of course, this r is a real number, so the only real number solution to this is going to be r equals 1, so r is going to be forced to be 1. Great. And n theta is going to be equal to what? n theta has to be equal to, say for example, 0 or 2 pi, or 4 pi, and then we go all the way up to what? We go all the way up to 2 pi times n minus 1, okay? And the reason we don't do what? The reason we don't do a, an n, say suppose we, we took this list and suppose that it went up to n. So what if I did the next one? Because this, you, you said, well, there's lots of solutions to being congruent to 0 mod pi. In fact, there's infinitely many. But if we went up to 2 pi times n, well, what's n divided by n? So that would tell me that theta would be equal to 2 pi, and that's the same thing as 0. So in other words, it starts to cycle back when we get to this point over here, n, right? So in other words, the first, I go from 0 up to n minus 1, so that gives me the values of theta. So theta are what? So theta is equal to 0, or 2 pi over n, or 4 pi over n, all the way down to 2 pi n minus 1 over n. And I see that we have exactly, we can write this in a more, we can parameterize this as saying theta is equal to 2 pi k over n, where k ranges from 0, 1, all the way up to 
n minus 1, okay? So now we have found our nth roots of unity using Euler's formula, using this complex fo form. So what are our nth roots of unity? So our nth roots of unity over here, so z to the n equals 1, implies that z is equal to e to the what? To the i i times what? Times 2k, 2 pi k, divided by n. For k equals 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n minus 1. And these numbers over here are called the nth roots of unity. So these are the nth roots of unity. And these numbers are going to be important in our discussion on the fast Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform. Okay? Great. And so typically what's done is we make a few other observations. So the last observation we're going to make over here is typically what we do is we typically can say that if we write zeta is e to the 2 pi i over n, then we can compactly write the roots of unity as zeta to the 0 power, zeta to the first power, zeta to the what? All the way down to zeta to the n minus 1 power, right? And so we typically will write our roots of unity as this sort of a set over here, right? And furthermore, we can sort of see by the structure of the cyclotomic ar um, argument over here that these roots over here, so any of these roots, which are not equal to 1, satisfy 1 plus z plus all the way down to z to the n minus 1 is equal to 0. So this structure, polynomial equation, persists when you factor out the z minus 1 from the equation over here, and this is called the cyclotomic polynomial equation. So the roots of unity, which are not equal to 1, satisfy a cyclotomic polynomial equation. Thank you very much.